Hey folks, so um, we're back with Mike. Thanks for having us again. My pleasure. Um, <coughs> and we're here for Beltane. Um, so yeah, uh, the mm. sun hasn't come out for us really. No, it makes it better with the camera though, doesn't it? Yes. I don't want yeah. dazzling We've got sunlight today. Good, good light for filming, but um, not amazing for our kind of, I guess, well, so Beltane is festival of fire and, and white and blossom. Yeah, well, we got that. We have our um, ooh, cherry blossom here. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's all on the floor. It's, it's like snow. If you, oh, look at that. Confetti. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you should be stood it? underneath it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's pretty, <laughs> it is pretty special time of year. Um, in theory, it's kind of the start of the summer, but it's like peak spring, all the blossoms out. Um, all the leaves are out. Have you got ash, oh, ash leaves out? Uh, they're just coming. Oh yeah. God, I could I could fill the whole of this thing talking about ash trees and ash dieback. We've got oh no! Experiments going full full tilt. Right. We we might I might I might drag you down the outside the house where there's this young ash tree just going up and up and up and up and up, and everyone tells me to cut it down bef before it takes out the foundations of the house, but by this autumn there's probably a walking stick in there oh well there we go but it looks like the top is suffering a little bit then we got another one by the stream which, which where within oh, the, i can see that one within yeah. a week it just went <coughs> you know it's like someone being at it with a flame thrower so oh, i cut no. the i cut the affected bit out and you can see there's leaves coming on on the rest of it now it's coming back so, yeah yeah well we'll we'll check out the ash trees later in the year okay. for the results yeah um but the hazel's not quite out yet either at the moment which is a bit bit weird but the, you see the thorn, the apple. Yeah, most 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 trees have got their leaves on. Hawthorn's just about to ping, and we're yeah. kind of we're actually in the last week of April here. Um, but Beltane's kind of like May Day, first of May. Um, yeah. It's all the blossom. Um, it's fires at night time. It's fertility. Um, but so, really, what does it mean for you this time of year? Forget pagan festivals. What's what's going on for you? Well, when I was young and energetic, this would be when I would just take off for a few days. We either, when I was living in Cheshire, we either went to Chesh, Chesh, Chester races, or I'd get out horse races. Horse races, oh, used to love it. Yeah, I'd, I bet you, know, you did. Yeah, head. yeah. Or I'd just get out on the motorway and stick my thumb out. And who did you go to the races with? Just mates or yeah. your parents? Girlfriend. Yeah. Probably. No, like as a that. as a kind of like teenager, out. late teenager, early twenties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in my head, I was a late teenager. It was probably yeah. sort of, uh, yeah, when I was in my 20s, actually. Yeah. I was living on the farm. Farm, this lovely little farm, which where which was completely dead, of, devoid of any life at all with the M, M thingy there and the M, new, brand new M56 yeah. there. That's your concrete farm that you that talked about. That's the concrete yeah. farm I've talked about. <laughs> then we go and see friends in Manchester and be woken up with a dawn chorus and birds singing and all that kind of stuff. Hilarious. <laughs> well, so, um, so yeah, you'd go out. It's a fun time to be out and about. People are out. You can be outside. I mean, everyone comes out then. I know if you're into forestry and you like walking and stuff, you're going to be out all year. But most people kind of hibernate a bit, don't they, until this kind of time of year. And then suddenly everyone's like in shorts and outside. Yeah. Um, so, and then in terms of like the kind of chair making and stuff like that, what's what what goes down this time of year? Well, for the last, well, half of my life, what I 70, 70 divided by two, 35 years, yeah. my life has revolved around the courses. Mm -hmm. And so we will have moved out over the last season. The equinox was, was when I'd move out to the woods and set things up. Yeah. And now we'd have everything up and running. <coughs> so uh, in the workshop here, uh, I've now got rid of the old transit seats and got the place pretty well ready for courses now. So that's the main thing is gearing up for the courses and yeah, looking forward to people arriving and sharing the delights of turning a, a log of wood into a, into a chair, which will last for centuries, hopefully. Brilliant. Perfect um, carbon sequestering. Carbon, carbon sequestration. Yeah. Which people are slowly logging on to. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, let's head into the workshop and talk a bit more about chairs, shall we? We'll do that then. Yeah. Great. After you. Which way is it? Oh, it's here. Through the door. 
Cool. So um, back in the workshop. Yeah. Uh, and so um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the chair evolution um, for you over the last kind of 20 years, so since 2005. And um, I came up and worked with you in like 2006 or seven or something like that. Or and eight. this, yeah, maybe eight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and no. um, <laughs> who knows? The old days. Know, it's all in the book. I've got Yeah, pictures you've of got it written <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so this chair was hanging up in, in the um, shelter of the workshop. Yeah. Uh, so talk us through what this chair is and to give us a kind of insight into the evolution on your kind of classes or your chairs. Okay, so can I trump that by going right back to what got me into all this was... Yeah, you do it. Finding out about the chair bodgers in High Wycombe and yeah. this contraption called a pole lathe, mm -hmm. <coughs> which I took to hook, line and sinker and really enjoyed making legs on it and then thought if you're going to make chair legs, then sooner or later you're going to have to make a chair. So I started making Windsor chairs. And this process had got me into green woodwork. So in the early courses, we were doing like anything. And then when we got to Clissett Wood in the 90s, it was honing in really on chairs. And we were doing some, <coughs> some Windsor chairs and some frame chairs. And the reason we came up here is because of an old guy called Philip Clissett his signature on the chair, you can tell it's a genuine one. No, you're not, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a bit late like, with what? a laugh there. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> good joke. Good joke. <laughs> but His handwriting's awful, <laughs> but he probably had arthritis from all that chair <laughs> making. He's getting pretty yeah. old by the time he made this one, yeah. Uh, can I just take you back, yeah. just briefly? So, um, <laughs> It's the wonderful thing about a pole lathe, and what a lot of people don't appreciate <laughs> is that turning basically makes things perfectly straight. Yeah. So, and that's amazing for joinery. You can turn these little tenons on the end. Yeah. Um, everything's straight, so you don't have to plane wood on four sides to kind of make it fit together. Yeah. Um, so it is a wonderful thing, and it's, that's exactly the point you were saying. Is like you kind of really enjoyed turning, and then you're like, "What am I going to do?" And there's no, there's not a whole heap of things that make sense turned on lathes. I know you can make like mashes or babies rattles, um, but at the end of the day, it then kind of comes down to making a chair. Um, so well, of course, nowadays everybody's got into making bowls, which I never thought. Yeah. yeah. There was Robin Wood, who was the only person left making bowls on the pole lathe, and now. Yeah. Thanks to various other people, that there's probably more people making bowls than there are making chair parts because it's something you've got straight. Here's a lump of wood. Boom. There's a bowl, uh, and off it goes. Chairs. I've actually just been to a bowl turning festival. Right. Yeah. Where the, was that? The the Northern Bowl. It <laughs> um, had an amazing name, the place, uh, but it was run by a guy called Matty Whitaker. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Bowls. Bowls, bowls are, are great. Worth it. Yeah. I mean, you know. But it's hard work. As it when we were talking work. to Robin Duckmanton, whose chair is up there, yeah, uh, uh, I think it was him who was saying, "Yeah, but it's hard work, isn't it?" Whereas turning on turning bits like this on a on a uh, on a pole lathe mm. is just a, a d absolutely delightful activity. And when I do get back on the lathe, I just I'm off off in ecstasy. But from the point of view of getting somebody to make a really good chair, yes, you ha teaching the process of making, uh, you know. Uh, make it a very precise joint because th these chairs are all around the precision of the joints getting them to work to decimal points of a millimeter within a few days of first using the thing is hard work yes totally and so then along came the tenon cutter well so just going back to yeah. um keep me on turning so because you uh <coughs> you've got your book green woodwork that's got in making a windsor chair has it that's got making a Windsor chair. It's also got making something like a spindle back. And yeah. I can't remember. And that's it. all turned on lathe. And yeah. talking about measurements, I'm sure you had things like a sharpened spanner or something. I don't um, think I mentioned that, but uh, what did we use? God. Yeah, there, there's um, a hook, uh, uh, it's a sizing tool, it's called, yeah. for doing the joints, which crept in um, and we used that. But yeah, some people use It's mostly Americans, so it's, it's a it? wrench. You know, oh, you okay. sharpen wrench. part on your wrench, yeah. and uh, you can turn joints relatively accurately like that. But it, it sort of takes the fun out of it. It's not that beautiful process. You know, when when you, I, in fact, I just happened to be looking at my, the lovely little film my daughter did of 
me making babies rattles on the pole lays and mm. uh, look that one up on YouTube because uh, it's really good. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll we'll put I'll a link, babies rattles. <laughs> uh, Meanwhile, back at chairs. Well, so, and then the other thing I was just thinking about tenon cutters, because the wood does turn oval, doesn't it? If you make it perfectly round when it's green, mm. and then it kind of shrinks oval. Yeah. So a lot of those old Windsor chair makers, they would have been buying bodged components in the woods that yeah. would have gone oval, and then they would have used tenon cutters or remounted them on lathes to... They would have remounted them on the lathes. I very much doubt they would have used tenon cutters. No yeah. tenon But they put them back on the lathes, turn them down to the exact size and put them together. Whack them together. But then when I was off in America in 93, um, at the World Turning Conference, uh, that's probably where I came across this concept of turning a piece of wood to size. Yeah, I knew the fact that it warped and shrunk as it dried. Mm. But this idea that if you know how much it's going to warp and shrink, then if you make it pretty well the right size when it's green, then when you come to put the chair together in a chair like this, a frame chair like this, rather than a Windsor chair, you can actually make use of that that oval shrinkage to create a quite a sophisticated joint that is, yeah, it's about a, a millimetre more in one dimension than it is in the other. Yes. And then you drill a, a hole, same size as a smaller dimension, squeeze it tight together. And I saw this, uh, I can't remember if I saw it in, a, in the States, but first time I saw that, I still vividly imprinted on my mind, uh, mm. going up to see Lawrence and Neville Neal putting their chairs together. Uh, and so that, I then ran with that one, moved, to Brookhouse Wood because because it would have its time, and part of the process of moving up to Brookhouse Wood was ditching the pole lathe. We kept it for a year or so. Still got uh, pictures. It's all to do with photos and <laughs> bits of film that are rattling around in my brain because my mm. memory is completely shot. Um, and uh, so then, yeah, then we adopted the tenon cutter. And okay, oh, so yeah. so we'll cut. We'll come on to the tenon cutter in a minute. Okay. And I think um, we're going to come back at some point, what, maybe when you've got a class going on, we'll have a little look at you putting um, some chairs together. Oh, you've got to and do we that can yeah. we can discuss the oval stuff in more detail then. Yeah. If you if, In the meantime, if you're yeah. fascinated, then you, you have to buy Mike's book. But we will get on to the oval stuff. But just coming back now mm. to um, this kind of evolution of this part of your mm. life. So at Clissett, you'd been doing a mixture of turned Clissett chairs and um, turned Windsor chairs. Uh, mm. Now, what is the relevance of this chair right here? Why is this important? This is a chair that we were given when we had a bunch of school kids come around the woods and we had a sort of open day and then <coughs> got a phone call that evening from the mother of one of the girls who said, oh, I think we got one of those old chairs in our shed. And we went there and there's a set of four. And at the time it was still just about usable. You know, they replaced the woven seat if you look carefully you can see where where it had rush seating here mm. they replaced that with a horrible bit of material with the tacks in it and things but it was still usable and so this along with another spindle so back, did it have all the woodworm in it uh or it is probably did yeah yeah the, yeah yeah, yeah, bit of wood worm. That, was, yeah. that was there and uh also i was out visiting uh Clissett wood the other day and the other chair that we were given at the time was a spindle back more like that one there with uh, yes. turn spindles so it was those two chairs <coughs> that uh, basically formed the basis of everything I've done since. Uh, and, you know, it's evolved. It, it's got a bit bigger. Um, and um, and so at the time, <coughs> was there anyone that you could go and um, get information from? Because I, I suppose the beauty of this one being broken is that you can see how the joints actually work. You can, yeah. Oop. Like <laughs> I did actually, it was horrible. I had to saw that last little bit off there. It was hanging on by that thread and it, 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 it just had to be liberated. So yeah, I mean, I, I totally remember um, this being used as a teaching tool mm. uh, in the workshop. Mm. Um, <coughs> and, and actually, it's, it is amazing to have something completely deconstructed. And mm. obviously this guy's um, very much revered for his work. Uh, but it's fascinating for me. I mean, I, I haven't actually looked at in detail at this for um, 12 years or so, but uh, yeah, why don't we come in and have a kind of proper look? It'd be really nice to get close up of the rung and how these joints work. Mm. So uh, this is nice and smooth turn f finishes. He's actually got a few little details here. He didn't go in for spectacular turning. Uh, but then when you look at this, you can see the cleave marks there. 
because this was going to be woven over uh, he didn't worry about putting a nice finish on it you can see there's a little bit of bark left there he was working really close he didn't want to be producing any more shavings that he had to and then there's the fascinating thing about this joint here you can see the back frame was assembled and then he would then get his spoon bit drill pop that in there go to within a millimeter of going through and drill through that so that this would then lock in there which then helps hold the whole thing t in place uh, and it's also noticeable <laughs> how uh, how little wood there is left by the time you've got drilled that hole and you've drilled this hole and it's hardly surprising really that after about 90 years use it uh, it snapped off there so we actually beef it up a little bit nowadays so, so what what kind of diameter is this do you know this is about 30 35 35 mil yeah, yeah and you go for 38 and, and we go for 38 yeah thereabouts yeah it makes a difference yeah it is amazing and so how are the how would these tenons have been made would that still have been turned to turn the tenon no. Or no. so that's just been shaved and banged and this in. again we learnt from uh neville and lawrence neil they were still using uh, apparently it was the same shaving horse that uh not clissett used but jim's ernest jimson hundred yeah. years ago uh they're still using the same shaving horse a nice film of uh, lawrence neil doing that on the internet again yeah hi lawrence uh and uh and when I went to visit them, he just got a chisel, four little bits there to put that point on the end and then yeah. wind it together. So, the, yeah, the tradition from this sort of goes right through to Lawrence, who's now the same age as me and passing on his skills. Amazing. So, so would it have been a spoon bit used? Is that why you need such so a that he been, heavy that chamfer? Have, undoubtedly, that was a spoon yeah. bit used there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, what we what we don't know about is is at what point this oval uh, joint crept in. Certainly, mm. Lawrence and Neville were using it, but they weren't using the natural shrinkage of the wood. They were they were they were um, they would dry to make the pieces. They'd dry them over the stove, and then they'd uh, probably again with a chisel. I can't remember make them into that oval shape. So sure. in fact, if we got a gauge on that, you'll see that's about 16 mil that way and about 14 mil that way. Right. Okay. And then, uh, then again, whether they were actually banged in or squeezed, but they, he will have used glue as well. Oh, Philip. Clisson. Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't realise that. Okay. So yeah, they're they're your kind of classic um, five eighths tenon basically, but um, shaved to. This actually is nine sixteenths. Nine sixteenths. Yeah. Right. There you go. Fourteen point three mil for the what in the what in the wide piece. direction? Uh, well, or that's the, the size one. of the hole. Yes, that's the sorry, size of this yes. Bit. Didn't I didn't describe these, that these well? Are probably, yeah. These are probably five eighths. These are almost certainly five eighths. Joints. So the tenons going in are slightly oversized in the other direction. So they're about five eighths, but the hole is um, nine sixteenths. Something like that. Which yeah. is your I mean, this is a, th you can see on this one here how it's they were actually turned down again before putting together uh, and that is that is a, a lathe cut isn't it and well, they hmm? they're not that oval are they or are they the legs are the these legs are oval. Here, you know they're, they're quite these similar. could be these may have even could, be put in dry I could uh, returned and then put in they would the, the whole thing would never no certainly not have been returned I could get a gauge on it if you like and measure it shall I do that yeah I think I'll so do yeah you buy that f I mean, it does feel round to me, but I mean, I, you know, don't take take my word for it. No. No, I mean, I yeah. don't. I'm not trusting myself at all I right now. I can't quite see which way the grain's going on this. If we measure that, that is nineteen point nineteen point two mil. So that's about three quarters of an inch in in the middle there. Yeah. If we turn it around a bit, let's see what we got there. Uh, it's not much different. You're, you're you're about right there. Nineteen point five. So there's a slight difference there. But I I'm, I remember measuring on the legs. Yeah. If we look at that, and I can see you can see the growth rings there. So that should be the narrow side, which is bang on. Well, thirty four point one. We then come round. Oh yeah. That's thirty five, thirty six, thirty six mil. So there's two mil difference there. Thirty four and thirty six. Yeah. Yeah. So this. Um, <coughs> this was undoubtedly turned when it was green um, and it wouldn't have been 
particularly dry. It will have been. I mean, we're, we're off on another whole whole yeah. chapter here. Let's detail, save. Let's we can save give that. that. I could get yeah. another chair over and show you exactly what goes on. Uh, the, again, the Americans make a big thing about this wet, dry mortise and tenon. Mm. So they say you want a nice wet mortise and a nice. I have to be careful. I say this and a nice dry tenon yes. goes into it and it sort of shrinks around. But my experience is if the, if it's too if this is too wet and that's really dry, well that wants to be really dry the tenon wants to be really dry. But if this is too wet, what can happen is that then the tenon swells up. Yeah and that gets bigger. Meanwhile, this is drying and shrinking a bit, so you, you can get splits on the leg there. So um, when Jenny Alexander was John Alexander and was still alive, we swapped notes on this and uh, decided that you want about 20% difference in moisture. So this wants to be about 10% moisture, about as dry as you can get it. And that wants to be sort of 20 to, well, air dries about yeah. 20 to 30% moisture. And then you've got the perfect joint and then you can do it dry without glue if you get everything right all the all these chairs have, have been put together without glue yeah totally and there's i mean there's so many different ways of doing it and there's so many fine nuances i think it'd be yeah. it would be great for us to capture more of that and to talk more about um jenny alexander and uh, do you know peter follinsby because he does quite I've a not lot actually of met peter but he, he he's a he nice worked guy a lot with, yeah. with jenny yeah yeah um so uh, yes, anyway, from here, I guess um, this is your kind of uh, standard Clissett chair that people would have been making on courses at Clissett Wood, turned on a lathe? It's this is all turned on a lathe. This is one that we made recently last, last year, whether it'll ever make the light of day, the Witch Elm project, um, <laughs> where we cut down a tree by hand four or five of us and we made two or three chairs I can't remember uh, the grain was really awkward and so my friend David Freeman who's very handy on the lathe he turned most of these parts and then left me to do the spindles we then <coughs> put the chair together and then uh, the first thing we did having cut the tree down was to take the bark off and cut it in strips mm. and this is a technique that we've pinched blatantly from what was then John Alexander, and I mean that was that was a uh, a you know a, a, a life changing thing when I read his book as well. Yeah, so lots of little things along the way. And so would and that, that would have been hickory bark, would it in America? So in the states they tend to yeah. do it with hickory bark. Although um, Dave Sawyer, I met met Dave Sawyer. He came over for chairs two thousand and four and talked to him. Said they used elm quite a lot over there as uh, well. Okay. I don't know what, exactly Amazing. what sort of elm, but uh, and but then Brian Boggs gave me uh, some tuition on putting the bark seat on. If any of the Americans get to see the way w that we've done bark seating with all these gaps in there, they'd, they'd throw their arms up in disgust. Uh, <laughs> whereas I'm quite happy with it, it seems to work. And if you've got, if you've got decent bark there, then you know, that'll last a good long while. That. Is and it's, that's on. just because um, you haven't bothered letting it dry and squishing it up and putting in an extra couple of Columns or rows yeah. or whatever, warp it, yeah. or weft. I'm not a, very good with the weaving. Uh, and so, so really, I mean, the relevance of this uh, chair, because you've made this um, with David Freeman recently, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you've actually moved away from this style, which we're going to get onto in a minute. But I think the interesting thing is that um, turning is great because it makes it perfectly straight and um, is, a, is a good way of dealing with awkward grain. And that's yeah. why you ended up doing this one recently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, let's, let's go and have a look at one of the ones that you kind of teach on a class. I think that'd be interesting for people okay. to see. Okay. Yep. So um, the kind of turned Clisset style of chairs that you were doing in the early noughties mm -hmm. evolved into these purely shaved mm -hmm. chairs that you now teach on your classes. Yeah. So um, talk us through some of the decision making, how, how that came about, what, what was that all about? Why the change? The change from turned chairs to shaved chairs is because I accepted the, uh, the tenon cutter uh, instead of the pole lathe. Uh, yep, that's the beast. And you can get a perfect joint every time with that and seeing as how the success of this 
revolves around the strength of the construction, uh, then that is critical. And so somebody could just walk straight into the workshop like you, pick that up, make mm. a perfect joint on the chair. And that just makes the, the assembly a whole lot easier. So in the past, when you were doing, um, trying to get them on the lathe, yeah. was it a case of like, oh no, we're going to have to drill some of these holes smaller? Were you always trying to get people to make them oversized and whittle them before they went into the holes? What, what, what were your solutions prior to the tenon cutter? It's a very Can good you even question. Remember? I've kind of erased that from my <laughs> memory. Um, yeah, uh, and we, we would have used glue. We did trial fits and then, yeah, you'd wang glue in there. Uh, whereas here, the other the other big thing here is that these are squeezed together very very tight. Yeah. Wh when the tenons are dry, uh, and then yeah, then this wet dry mortise and tenon thing does come into mm. play to a, a, to my mind a, a lesser extent than some people think. But then that will, as time goes on, the chair will just get sounder. You know. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I I've got a lot of experience of your chairs f from, you know, I guess since 2008 or whenever. Yeah. And um, I've seen a lot of your old chairs using um, this oval technology uh, and they don't, they don't come apart. They um, don't, no. And I've, you know, helped squeeze together a hundred chairs. I don't know. We're on this with this sash cramp yeah. and heard it creak as it goes in. So yeah. we'll try yeah. and capture that at some point when yeah. you're running a class. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think this is one of the things that for me was so special when I was helping out on your classes was just how much fun it all was and what an amazing time everyone had. And I think actually there is a part of that in terms of designing a class where you're not just racing around and people having this problem, that problem, and but actually trying to keep it simple and um, yeah, I guess people just shaving away on horses. Um, and using the tenon cutter. I think, so you definitely have had them on with braces, haven't you? And not just, when did the electric oh, drill come to the woods? That's been, w when I used the Veritas one, uh, and this was, happened in 2005, 2006, when I moved up to Brook Aswell. I didn't use them when I was at Clissett Wood. Yeah. Uh, and, um, <coughs> yeah, there's a, a, a story around that. We, uh, Normally chair joints are five eighths or sixteen mil mm -hmm. or bigger, three quarters of an inch, nineteen mils, usually one of those two. And it, we'd been making them at five eighths, sixteen mil. Um <coughs> all the time I'd been making chairs. Uh so it was then if I'm gonna use this shrinkage, it's a matter of finding the right size tenon cutter because they're made in Canada, so they're still in what the Brits call imperial units. Uh, yes. Uh and Oh, what do Americans call it? I can't remember. I did Just write it down somewhere, units. but I don't think they like the term imperial. No. <laughs> I may be wrong. Uh, uh, anyway, so um, so then uh, we scaled it down a bit. So then I was using the 5 eighths or 16 mil tenon cutter in the first place. And then if you take 10% shrinkage off that, you're then down to 9 sixteenths or 14.3 mil. So we were using 9 sixteenths drill bits. And then because it was easier in Europe, as we then were, to get hold of 14 mil drills. So we mm. went down to 14 mil. So they got, the joints got even tighter and tighter. But in fact, hopefully winging their way to me now is some wood owl drills, which I saw at Peter Wood, which he acknowledges to Sean Hellman, uh, is, and who discovered them before Sean. Obviously, whoever made them must have discovered them. For, anyway, sorry, I'm waffling. Uh, well, so you guys must find and, and seek out these other people because we have a lot of amazing people <coughs> in this country yeah. in woodwork. Sean yeah. Hellman's amazing, Peter Wood's amazing, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. maybe more on them another time. But yeah, yeah Wood yeah. Owl is a type uh, of drill bit. It's a type of drill bit uh, and they're American, made in Japan. And oh. they, so they're working in, in the old, uh, our old units. Uh, right. So they're 9 sixteenths. So that will make the squeezing together not quite so tight so by the end of this season I mean this is one of the wonderful things about running yeah. courses is that every course it has a big element of research and development I've been doing it for what 35 years or so yeah. and there's still not a course goes by where we're not playing about with new ideas and trying to push things on a little bit this is the sort of bog standard for want of a dreadful term simplest 
chair, everything. Basic intro chair. Basic yeah. intro chair. Everything hangs on drilling a hole and squeezing something into it. Uh, and it's, it's that, so the, the construction bit gets simplified. And like you were saying about shaving horses, mm. the pole lathe is a wonderful, th absolutely blissful thing to use when you, when you master it properly. But for the beginner, you know, the, the, there's some pretty horrible things out there on YouTube of people ostensibly knowing how to use a pole lathe. But, uh, but a shaving yeah. horse, again, so long as you're a bit careful and don't cut yourself, uh, somebody can sit on the shaving horse, get a piece of wood, get a draw knife, and they're away. It's just wonderful. You know. And so I suppose this is what makes it your, your basic. Um, when I was with you, it was all still about living wood book. Um, mm -hmm. which you can still just about buy and still got a few hundred of those left yeah have you hundred, yeah. yeah and, and then one or two of you bought bought some recently thank you bye yeah great and uh <laughs> so so that was i can't remember what was the um what was it the one called that was the standard one on the class the with, the, with the with oh, the it what do you call the bits on the back not the lats. crest no, the the, when you've got a few ladder back chair. Oh, there ladder back chair. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You had your standard ladder back yeah. chair that everyone would come and make, and yeah. you had to have really pristine wood, and then you've got all these awful mortises to yeah. have to yeah. dig out, which yeah. take forever. If you look on the old Clissett chair, you can see, you know, even that chair was after he'd been making them for 60, 70 years or so. Yeah. And it's still got sloppy joints. Yeah, you can still it's see really the sloppy, off. actually. Yeah. I've got, I've, I mean, I love Clissett and I love his chairs, but. Maybe he was getting old. Those those mortises are sloppy, and also not. There's not a lot of bend in those slats. No, you don't actually need a lot of bend. I sometimes no. think we maybe overbend it, but uh, yeah, that's a minor point. But the, these are y on the courses. We we may spend the whole of the first morning just producing these, so that they people get the the hang of cleaving because. Pole lathe turning is nice when you can do it. Shaving horse is great, but cleaving is what it's all about. That is the yes. what sets the green wood thing apart from any other kind of woodwork. And cleaving these little spindles, you know, if you get nice, clean, fresh, well-grown ash that hasn't got ash dye back, <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a delight. And I used to start off by cleaving out the back legs, but then we'd end up with significant quantities of waste firewood. Um, or stuff that you could then cleave smaller. But uh, so it's nice now if I start people off by <coughs> cleaving the spindles mm. and they can produce as much waste as they want because it'll all go in the kindling pile. Well, and so it, the, the cleaving is a fascinating thing and we'll, mm. we'll maybe um, do, do some cleaving in one of these videos. But I remember um, there was a large part of it's about not wasting material, but it's also just efficiency. If you're trying to get as many it's components efficiency. out of the log, then you're not wasting material and you're not wasting time shaving stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded. Mm -hmm. I went and helped on someone else's kind of chair making class after working with you. And they they weren't, I think they weren't even necessarily using froze. They certainly weren't using a cleaving break. Right. Um, and more than half the wood was just <laughs> going as firewood. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the cleaving is an Im important part. And certainly w when I was working with you, yeah, you were doing the, the kind of legs first. And the idea was that any mistakes would then be able to be turned into rungs. And yeah, rails yeah, and the, yeah. Those are all the bits that you've got to make first, right? So all the things with tenons on need to get in the hot box early on in the class so that the tenons are drying out. Yeah, but you also want to get the steaming done in the class. I mean, yeah. it, it, it might be that the co courses evolve so that we spend a couple of days making all the bits and then you get day three off and then we'd be so slick with the assembly we can <laughs> razz the whole thing together <laughs> on day four and seat it on day five uh yeah uh, because uh, again when you come back another time we'll look at assembling a chair yeah and uh yeah you know we, we we're getting slicker and slicker with with the process and that's a bit that's a bit that i i, I enjoy you know uh is the is the yeah you know the engineering of it i suppose mm. as much as anything which is where it's totally different from you with your spoons that is an art that is a craft this is almost a sort of engineering project, and as long as people do what I tell them, they'll go away with a good chair, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I would argue that um, spoons need to be engineered as well. If you're, if you're looking for functionality, you well, need to right, be thinking okay. about strength yeah, and grain yeah, orientation. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, certainly a lot less hassle than making a chair. So, and then um, just touching on uh, what we were saying earlier about the turn chair. So the turn chair worked well when you had this really awful grain and you're trying to make something nice and straight. Yeah. Um, but one of the joys about shaving is that you don't have to have it perfectly straight, do yeah. you? So, yeah. Um, yeah. We, uh, what I try and do is encourage people to get these two rungs out of the same out of the same log. Uh, so okay. if there is any natural flow to the grain, you can see this this does curve a little bit. And I, I really do my best to get them to follow the flow of the grain. Again, some of the Americans and John, Jenny, Alexander would be quite insistent on getting them straight, uh, regardless of what the grain wanted to do. Whereas uh, this is partly, you know, the influence of Gudrun and my wife Tamsin is this more sort of Touchy feely, dare I say that? Wabi sabi. <laughs> Wabi sabi. Daoist. Hippie. Daoist. Go with the grain, man. Uh, and I'm, I fully adopt that now. And uh, I, I like that process of you know, going with the flow of the fibres. And so, you know, when we were looking at the Clissett chair, we had that little bit of cleavage here. Well, when you look at this, this uh, thing, yeah, you right, got a little yeah. bit like that, which, um, you know, cabinet makers would regard as a dreadful thing, whereas it adds to the character, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, to me that adds to the character of the chair and makes it, you know, look that little bit more handmade. This is a little bit more subtle, you wouldn't, most people would tend not to say, oh look at the curve on those two, but there's something, there's something kind of handmade, organic yes. about it. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. which, which I like. Great. Okay, so, um, classic modern chair course the um, other thing i love about this is the feel of it especially oh, when okay. we're squeezing it together but also once the frame is is put together it's not just not just how it looks and how strong it is but there's the feel of it and there's even the sound and, it's, and uh, that's what makes them unique you know some people think you know the heavier thing is the better it is but chairs you don't want big heavy chairs you know you no it's a hassle to carry it around yeah then. yeah so something like this you know if you want to sit up against the table you can you can do that so i suppose that that comes in obviously to the cleft wood again you can have thinner bits of wood because it's stronger yeah, it's going with right the grain. it's got that last you know the legs when you're squeezing it together you can see the legs flexing mm. lovely, and especially lovely. when you've got the kind of um a bark seat as well is incredibly light compared to uh, maybe a rush seat or something like mm, that. Yeah, bark seats are light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is it? So so it doesn't often come my way nowadays. Uh, with alas, the witch on back. Bark. No, but there you go. It's very special when it does. Yeah. Okay. There we go, bark. Okay. Whoa. And so. Um, yeah, I guess, so fr from my point of view, I, I think these are the nicest shaved chairs that you do. I think, um, I do, I did really like the ladder back chairs, uh, but then you were kind of moving on to, would you call this a laugh back? I call that a laugh back. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. when I was hanging out, that's, this was more of the direction that you were going in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I can understand, obviously, this is a lot more of a faff on a class, having to put the the kind of longer um, mortises in. Considerably more yeah. flap about, yeah. This is an unusual one, and this is witch elm, and this is taken from wood that was left once the bark had been stripped, and you can see, uh, you can see this dark stuff here is what happens to the wood, the surface of the wood. This it must be uh, some sort of reaction between the uh, the sap and the atmosphere. And it ends up going black, uh, and I was trying to retain that blackness. Mm. So that was again was a bit, bit more fiddly. Normally on these chairs, we, you know, we, we haven't got to mess about with that. But you're drilling three holes next to each other, and like you then fall into the same sort of problems as with the ladder back. Um, but I do find this more comfortable with that. It's a nice process that steam bending these lasts and they do fit nicely in the small of your back. So, but that's just a kind of advanced course. You know, if somebody wants to come back on a second course, then they maybe have the option of that. But it takes at least an extra half day to, to do that. And then of course, then we've got the issue up here, which we'll probably play about with as these programs go on. This, this is, as far as the woodworking goes, this is where my interest lies in, is in this 
mortise and tenon at the top. Yeah. Fun, funny things that occupy people's minds, you know. But <laughs> well, I think that's the that's the, for me is the real joy of um, craft, isn't it? It's those little obsessions. Yeah. Obsession, and often, that's the word, yeah. often people um, would just yeah, it's hard to explain why it's so important to you. Yeah, yeah. And it's nice when they kind of you know you can look back over decades and think, oh, at this time I was obsessed with this, and this yeah, time I was obsessed yeah, with that. Yeah. yeah, a few years ago it was the seating more and all the patterns in the seating and I, I thought oh well that's just sort of old age you know but uh, yeah well let's, so let's have a look at that and I, so I have to say I was not interested in that at all um, and 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 I think that's partly because of my brain I couldn't really cope with the <laughs> complexity <laughs> of the weaving so whenever I was helping you um, teach chair making I just yeah. wanted to do the witch arm because it was a simple right, yeah. pattern to do yeah, yeah. Um, but then so this is you, you've stained this or something have you Th th what uh, this is a chair I made for Tams in an office chair uh, it's about 30 mil narrower across the front, so it would fit in the desk. Oh, and it's right. a little bit yeah. taller, <coughs> so it's, it's a little bit of a one-off. Um, but uh, now when it came to seating it, I was just basically using up a whole load of old stuff that we had dyed. This is my favourite colour, is the onion skin colour here. Um, these, this is a mixture of berries, elderberries and... Uh, we haven't got any walnut skin. That's a walnut shell. That's another beautiful dark brown. Mm. Dark. And so, what is this? Is this paper rush or something? This or? is Danish cord. Danish uh, cord, which is oh, a right. papery kind of material. It's yeah, like the same, it is actually the same material as uh, they make artificial rush, uh, paper rush with. Yes. Um, but it, so it's, it looks a bit like seagrass, but it's much much stronger. I, I got fed up with seagrass. Um, and so, yeah, I, I use use Danish cord most of the time now for seating. Yeah, and this is this is a variation on the Irish seat pattern where we actually weave it in and out, which just stops some of the problems associated with having long unsupported lengths going across there. Mm. So this works. This is the uh, it's not quite the skein of geese. There's another pattern I've got called the, the skein of geese, which all these patterns have evolved out in my workshop over the time. You should do a little book booklet on your patterns because you've got a book with all your patterns in. Some of them are like really complicated, aren't they? Yeah, like yeah. Some of them have got like that kind of like uh, I don't know, slightly almost illusion. We've kind got of the herringbone, herringbone pattern. The, yeah. And then there's the what we call the Froom Valley pattern because uh, it did evolve there, and that's that's what we tend to use. Uh, don't think I've got any examples here. Yeah. But then actually just this year, I've gone back to playing about with rush seating last autumn. We, uh, I hate the, the, the traditional pattern yes. with four triangles because there Why? are a lot. Of Hate's a strong word for a chair. It, it, but it's, it's the word. <laughs> <laughs> because there are people out there who d devoted their craft to learning how to do that and they do it really beautifully. Yeah. And I come along and I, 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 I can't do it myself. No, neither can I show people how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't do that. Whereas we can get some <coughs> decent looking chair bottoms out of this. But then we discovered the Scandinavian variation on that. Mm. And uh, we can get sort of halfway decent seat with that. And, you know, so it's, uh, beauty, as I keep saying, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. So somebody will come on a course and want to use, make some kind of pattern, then I'll try, mm. and, try and accommodate them, you know. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, it's just nice that there's diversity, right? Yeah, like that's yeah, yeah. And yeah. another thing to play with. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, so it's nice to be talking chairs. It's um, great to be talking chairs. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it would be good. Maybe we should see a um, bit of shaving horse tenon cutter in action and... Mm -hmm. um, then we'll have a quick look at the garden and then mm. we'll leave you to the rest of your day at some mm. point, mm. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> oh, we should have some lunch. We'll yeah, that'd be lunch, nice, yeah. yeah. Great, all right, well, let's um, get a bit of wood on the horse, shall we? Okay. Yeah.
Great, so you've split your bit of wood out, mm -hmm. and uh, this is just great because it's giving us a little bit of context. We might go into more detail an another time, and also you've, you have mentioned that you've done, you have done a video with someone making a chair, so um, hopefully at some point we'll be able to link into that. Uh -huh. um, but right now, essentially you've cleft out a bit of wood that's probably 20 mil? 20 mil? 20, 25 mil. Yeah. Um, or yeah, so kind or of coming up to an inch for you. Qu quarter, quarter three like quarter that. inch to an inch. Yeah, and um, this this would be a rung. Um, this will be a rung. Yep. And um, so yeah. would you like me to start shaving it, Byron? Yeah. And okay. Yeah, talk us through it. What what would you say if you were doing your first demo on a class? What I'd would you say be telling them? You get your draw knife, <laughs> and this is nice. Basically, just keep taking it off the corners, in a with a slicing cut uh, a nice little story there's a guy who came on a course once who trained as a butcher and he says you can get a knife as sharp as you like and do that if you slice it across your hand you'll get blood all over the place so rather than what a lot of people would love to do when they come on the course for some reason is to get a nice flat surface yeah. and to do that and to come along there and get a straight flat surface what you want to be doing is gliding through those corners if you just keep taking the corners off you'll end up with something round and then fairly early on in the process turn it around this is quite a long run run in the long run so this is like a front um front rung yeah yeah and then when you're working quite hard like this and you can it's a bit like rowing, you know, you can use your whole body, not just your arms. Just one or two strokes. There are some nice bits of old video of the old chair bodgers around. They would have had a quite a different sort of shaving horse, but they just took one or two strokes. And uh, then just moved it slightly. So the combination of the hand and the foot doesn't take long to get that coordination together really so it's I'm very um satisfying action isn't it it's a lovely action very uh i don't know about meditative but uh yeah and this is probably the the most accessible shaving horse out there in terms of like going to your hardware store buying some uh some wood and screwing it together basically that's basically it. yeah cut the bars work and Not so this is on your website. Would you call it's this the Lumber Horse or something? Yeah, yeah Champion lumber. the Lumber Horse, for anyone who remembers those days. Uh, and there's, there's a very nice video out by a friend of mine on how to, you know, sort of speeded up video of how to put one of these together. Oh, right, great. Great, well, maybe we can link to that as well. Yeah. Um, so this is your, your um, basic chair component. It's a rung. It's now about three quarter inch maximum. Diameter. Yeah. Is yeah, it? yeah. What about Hopefully. in the middle? But a little bit in fatter the middle, in the middle. It's a little bit fatter in the middle. Yeah. But uh, so I would th at this stage I would now take it over to the tenon cutter. Yeah. Put the tenon cutter on both ends, and uh, and then I would actually probably come back with a push knife just to remove the shoulders on the wood. Oh, okay. Shall we have a look at that? Yeah, let's do that. Let's yeah. do that. Let's um, see tenon cutter in action. So, um, just talk us through the, the basically the tenon's got a tenon cutter has got a spirit level on it, right? So all yeah, you it's need got is this little bubble in there, which is clever. So I get this 
get the bench level, get a piece of wood same height as the clamp there. So this is pretty well horizontal. And then I tuck this in, tuck it into my body and spread my feet. And when the bubble is level, I then align it and pull the trigger and off we go. Wow. <laughs> and then uh, while I'm at it, I just put a little chamfer on the end. So this is a, this is actually a 5 16 or 8 mil tenon cutter, same as I use on the end of the spindles or same size. I leave that in the uh, brace and then flip that around. So when, when I was with you, I suppose maybe it was just efficiency because you're teaching more people at the same time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you had like a, a, a kind of shoulder level vice that was on one of the hot poles. Yeah, I um, remember that. Yeah, it's slowly coming back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, was, that was a good option. There's, so there's lots of different ways. You just need to hold a bit of wood level. Yeah, basically. I mean, part of the idea of having that horizontal bed on the, pole, on the shaving horse is so you can sit there and do it as well. But oh, I've okay, sort of yeah. forgotten, forgotten to do that. It's, it, it, it's better to grip it properly in a vice. Yeah. We're off again. Yeah. There we go. And uh, Bob's so that uncle. should be a nice, precise size. And then, yeah, what I tend to do is get rid of these shoulders. No need to particularly, but um, uh, I just like to do that, really. For yeah. The time. Let's have a look at that then. Okay. Cool. So um, we'll have a look at this sheathing. Uh, hopefully you, you guys can hear us well over the lawnmower next door. Uh, it's definitely the time of year to start mowing your lawn. I've noticed you've mown your lawn, which is Mowed nice. especially for you, Barn. Oh, thank you. Mm. Had a special haircut as well. Oh, yeah. Ta Tamsin mowed your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. So, and can we just say, so the tenon's 20, 25 mil deep. Yeah. Um, you have to set or that on the inch deep. Um, and then that gives you 10 mil for the lead screw of the drill. And also just a bit of strength, I guess, in the leg. Uh, yeah, if we're going into 35 mil, 38 mil, then we've got 25 mil plus the lead screw. Great. Yep. Right. And, uh, so, uh, shall I start using this then? Yeah. What okay. is it? This is, uh, I think they call it a draw knife in the catalogs, FlexiCut, American, um, but I call it a push knife. Uh, and I lean into the wood like that. Just put it flat on the tenon there to remove that shoulder and then just lean into it because and I've got it pretty well to size there's not not a great deal of wood to get rid of and presumably so this kind of um, the answer's in the name a bit I suppose flex cut the blade flexes a little bit and and that's because it's quite they're quite thin blades yeah and that's probably important for sheathing you wouldn't want to be going in with a really thick blade might start kind of splitting big big chunks off? Do our friends know what when you say sheave, sheaving? Isn't that what you call it? That's what I call it. Oh, yeah, I, I thought you'd mentioned that. No. Oh, I might have mentioned it. They might not have seen it this episode. Though. It's not in living wood, but it's in growing, going, going with, with the, the grain. grain. Yeah, yeah it's, where grain. it's a cross between shaving and cleaving. So right. uh, yeah, it's tearing the wood away. So I don't particularly want a razor sharp edge on this. I don't want to be able to get in there. Oh, um, OK. And uh, but so why are you using this knife and not a draw knife? Uh, if I were to <coughs> use the draw knife, that does work much. I mean, I, I suppose I could, I could do that. Yeah. It's not this first time it's uh, occurred to me, <laughs> but it's just <laughs> easier with that one. Oh, the just because the handle's the other way around. Yeah, the draw knife you tend uh, to put, got pull you. towards you, oh, and, and then, then if you did that, that then you yeah. would clip that, clip that, and make it yeah. too small. Sorry, so I thought, uh, so the whole thing I was saying about the thin blade is, is rubbish. Oh, it's not rubbish, but it happens to have a thin blade. But and it's not, not, does the not important nicely. for your sheathing. <laughs> yeah, I realise yeah. it's not a proper word, is it? Uh, uh, no, no, there's a German word, schieben, but it's nothing to do with that. But it sounds yeah. very much like it, doesn't it? I'm just getting that last little bit off in the middle there, which I could use either this knife, the push knife or the, the draw knife. In fact, really, Barn, I'm just passing time while we're chatting. This is just about, now I'll just get that little lump off there. And uh, 
and that could now go straight into the dryer. That is 16 mil. When it comes out, in theory, it should be, well, it would be, because this is nice, fresh. I got this. This is one of the bits that have been sat in the bath for, for a couple of weeks, I think. Uh, so that's full of moisture. It's nice and cool and moist. And uh, then it will shrink about 10% uh, in that direction and about 5% in that direction, ready to be squeezed straight in without further ado into the joint. Great. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll, um, we'll come back to chairs another time. Uh, is mowers definitely going now? Um, maybe we should go and have a little look at your garden and uh, it may look like it might rain in a bit. So we'll it's not going to rain till Sunday. But oh, is uh, it? <laughs> I mean, I know that as well because I've looked at the weather. But <laughs> <laughs> You've ruined my story. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got yeah. to wash it out as well. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, it is cloudy, though. It is cloudy. Would yeah. you be able to tell it wasn't going to rain without looking at the Met Office? <laughs> without looking at the Met Office, no. No, no. <laughs> but it isn't going to rain till Monday, so... That's what they say. Yeah. Sunday, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. And that might only be drizzle, and then it might not. But by the time this film goes out, we'll know. Yeah. We can maybe put it in the notes what, what <laughs> day it did rain. Because you, you actually do have your own little meteorological station, don't you? Oh, I've got Do you I've collect rainwater and count how many millimetres still? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. And why do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Cool, come on then. Let's go and have a look at these apple trees or something. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, out in your garden, what, what's, what's going on? What's been going on? What's going on? we got the apple tree there with its... Blossom starting That's to quite, shed. Yeah, it's quite a big. That you get a lot of apples off that. You must we get do get lot. quite a few. Yeah. yeah, it's not my favourite tasty ones. Oh, we, we looked at the little sunset apple, didn't we? Up we were top, pruning yeah. up the top. That's that's the little beauty. That's yeah, it's really nice. Tasty, but is this? These are eating apples, but just yeah, not that are. nice. Yeah, no. Yeah. Good for animals. Good for animals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, and then so I can see. Um, You've been doing some digging here. What's digging that, that, what's that all be, about? That's going to be climbing French beans this year. Uh, it's been runner beans the last few years, and they grow up and climb right up to the top of the workshop. You wouldn't believe how. Really? Yeah, so I put a ladder up. Do you have to put up. loads of I, poles? I, yeah, I'll put some poles in there when the beans are there. I've still to plant the seeds yet. I think I'm a little bit late this year. but. Uh, oh, well, you've got to. It would be amazing to come back and see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. When, okay. So when will those be ready? Uh, yeah, in the summer. Summer, sometime. like <laughs> August or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 cool. All no, right. The, the the French beans. Yeah, they they did. It's first time I'd grown climbing French beans last year, and they were just yeah. they just went berserk. But like, you're a big fan of French beans, aren't you? I like French. I prefer runner beans. Tamsin prefers French beans. But yeah. So we 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 get both. And we'll probably have some mange too as well, which need to be planted soon. I think. Yeah. Oh, and we're going to plant sweet favorite. corn for the first time. Really? I'm not big fun yeah you can get that in the supermarket but it is supposed to be really good when you get it fresh but you need that'll have to be out here you need lots of sunshine yeah for the sweet corn so we'll see how that goes but we, we got the i've got my little new potatoes they only just popped up last week oh these ones these yeah are new potatoes I, nice i think they needed everything's really thirsty it's been really dry this spring right and then you got the broccoli just on its last legs now it's done as first time i've grown broccoli but that's done really, really well this winter. Well, yeah. winter, spring. We got some last year. I, I should be planting next year's broccoli actually in little pots now. It's, it's, it's a year long project that. Cool. But best of all is what's going on up in the bath up the top there. All right, well, let's go and, let's go and see that. Let's do that. Your washing's out. And Hopefully the washing's that out. won't. It does look like it might rain. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll be wet, <laughs> wet by if it stays out there till Sunday evening. Yeah. <laughs> Great, so another bath. Where do you get all your baths from? Yeah, well, two of them out of the bathroom. We took one out when we moved in and then we just had the bath redone. It's extravagant, isn't it? But you know. wonderful things, baths. They're, They're very really useful. And yeah. so what's going on in this one then? Uh, may I lift this up and show you? Yes. That's, the, that's the old shower curtain. Oh, and okay. See that yep. black bungee, that can be used to hold this up if necessary. Yep. So this year it's baby carrots, which I'm very pleased with. They've done nicely. Uh, and uh, then, oh, only again, about a week or so ago, I just planted all these little seedling things in here. I planted them out in the open there, and, and even if it's dry, the slugs have got them, or they just, they're just much happier in nice little plastic pots. So 
Right. And I suppose it's easy easy to see a slug on the on the white enamel. If, if a slug gets past. in here, I'll shoot the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. There's a, there's a weed. Get out. Yeah. Be gone. Um, and this is Asian leaves. If you yeah, if you want to mark things, uh, it's well well worth trying to find a waterproof pen to write them with, though. But yeah, or pencil. Or I, I know, I never thought of that. I think this is Asian leaves as well. I don't know why these are doing better. <laughs> yes, coriander. <this> Maybe <laughs> I don't know. Coriander, and that's red salad, which well. I had out there, and it's not done anything. So these are three tubs of red salad, and you can see that one there looks a lot happier than these two, which don't get covered so well by the shower screen but that keeps you know keeps the cats uh, you know because the cats like sitting on the warm earth yes especially somewhere protected from the dog <laughs> amazing the dog likes chasing the cats <laughs> and then the pigeons <laughs> like making oh the birds are a real the pain as well the birds can get yeah. in there as well so this is this, it, it works it, it works nicely and yeah, keeps it pleasing. warmer and yeah. yeah yeah and i guess was reasonably cheap although you are kind of rusting away some perfectly good chair making f clamps this is true but um i was just thinking actually how well they've done over it probably this this must be the third year in use i think yeah yeah great well it's lovely to see the garden fully in action and everything going on got our hawthorns just about to go for it which i very much see as a beltane thing i guess oh it's, yeah um, oh it is it's, it's that beltane kind of time thing, yeah time of year um but yeah i suppose uh i'm desperate for the loo and uh <laughs> we should probably have lunch and then get out of your hair so um we'll call it a day and um expecting to come back and have carrots at some point well, we'll, we'll yeah probably be able to pull a carrot or two then yeah certainly Amazing. salad yeah yeah brilliant right Cheers, guys. We'll see you next time. Check out all our videos and um, enjoy Beltane. Get, get a bonfire going and um, rejuvenate yourself.